Okay. All right. Good morning. Good to see you all again on this beautiful day, beautiful sunny fall day. And um, I've been a little bit remiss. I forgot uh, they sent out an email a few weeks ago, and I forgot that this is Native American Heritage Month. So I wanted to honor that by, um, just like I did with Hispanic Heritage Month, by honoring some Catholics, Catholic, Native American Catholics, Catholic saints, uh, people who have been uh, important to the Catholic Church in our country, in the United States of America. There aren't too many of them, um, so, uh, so take it for what it's worth. But I'll start with um, the first major saint, who is this woman called Saint um, Cater, I'd say Kateri, but I guess it's pronounced Goddery, but I'll say Kateri because that's what I grew up saying. Saint Kateri Tekakwitha. And let me write her name on the board here so you can see it. Kateri, which is Mohawk for Catherine. Tekakwitha. And she lived from 1656 to 1680. So she died young. She died in her mid-20s. I don't know from what, but she died in her mid-20s. She was born in what is now the state of New York, which would make her an American. But even though it was before the United States was even founded, it was still a British colony. Um, colonial outpost but she was founded and she grew up she was born in a town which was as part of the state of new york and was actually an indian town she was a native american so it wasn't even america it was native american it wasn't american american so that's that's uh anyways um and she was uh algonquin mohawk so she was part of there were different tribes and, and different uh groups within native americans and uh, apparently the mohawk said um, attacked her her mother's village at one point and taken her mother captive. I don't know if they took her as a slave or not, but they took her captive and then her mother married the chief and her mother was Algonquin. So she was um, from two ethnicities, both Mohawk and Algonquin Indian. But she's usually, well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, she was, uh, at an early age, she contracted smallpox. I don't know from where. I don't know if that was from European contact or not, because by the 1600s, the Europeans had been in the area. But nevertheless, she contracted smallpox, which kind of disfigured her face for the rest of her life. She had scarring on her face and apparently also affected her eyesight. Oh, I should also mention this, Tekakwitha, her Indian name that was given to her means she who bumps into things. <laughs> so, so I think it's kind of humorous. But anyways, um, I don't know if that was because of the smallpox that affected her eyesight or it was just one of those ironic things. God has a sense of humor, you know, um, but she who bumps into things. Anyways, um, Christians were in the area. There were Jesuit priests. The Jesuits are part of a group called the Society of Jesus, a religious order. And they were missionaries in the area and had established some outposts there with the uh, French colonizers. And at 19, she converted to Christianity and uh, she took a vow of virginity. She decided she, contrary to what was the common practice of her people and of most people, I would say, she decided she wanted to keep her sexual um, activity private, I guess you could say, but just de dedicate her whole self to the Lord and to the service of God. And so she took a vow of virginity not to marry. Because she converted to Christianity, she was accused of being a sorceress or a witch um, by her, by her uh, native people who didn't understand, you know, for them this was foreign and anything foreign was considered negative. So they thought, you know, she was she's weird, you know, she was doing something that was abnormal by converting to this European belief system. So they thought she was a witch. And so she went to live in the Jesuit, one of the Jesuit mission houses. And usually the, the mission, and we talked about this with uh, St. Juniper or Junipero Serra out in California, the Fran who was a Franciscan, a different religious order. But the Franciscans did kind of the same thing. They set up missions along the coast of California. The Jesuits did the same thing. And sometimes this is seen as 
negatively as aspects of colonial colonialism that the Europeans were trying to overtake and to change the native culture. To some extent, that was true, and that did happen. But a lot of times, it was for protective purposes. And a lot of times, Native Americans would go live in the missions, just like with um, Junipero Serra, um, and they weren't trying to destroy them or destroy their culture or who they were, but there was a protective, it was protective because you could be subject to violence for being an outcast or being an outsider in, um, in your Native American community. And as she was, she was, you know, there was certainly negativity there. If they thought she was a witch, they might kill her. So she went to live there. Eventually, she got sick. I don't know what she got sick with. I didn't have enough time to do research on that to track down why she got sick. But at around, I think, the age of 24, she got sick and she died. And people venerated her, recognized that she was a holy woman. Uh, I think there were also some visions of her after her death. Some people claim to have seen her, not, not alive. Um, but has seen her visions of her saying she's on her way to heaven and stuff like that. But people rec certainly recognize she was a holy woman. And so I asked for the prayers of St. Kateri Tekakwitha, um, not only on all Native Americans in this country that may be blessed and may prosper, but upon all of us here. Amen. <laughs> Okay, let's see who's here. Batch. Mateus Ojeda and Ms. Reyes. And Mr. Thomas. Okay, good. Oh, this is a picture of her that I have, obviously, I'm showing you a picture of her. But um, you can see the information at the bottom by, it's one of the oldest portraits of her by Father Claude Cochetier, who knew her. So, I mean, I don't think it's... Uh, you, you know, you see, it's it's a nice piece of, it's a nice work of art. I don't know how accurate it is to how she actually looked, but, you know, it might be since he knew her and, and it was done pretty, pretty early after her death, um, or I shouldn't, yeah, pretty soon after her death with 16 years. Nevertheless, it's the earliest portrait we have of her, take it for what it's worth, but there's a portrait of St. Kateri Tekakwitha. The lily, as she's sometimes called, the lily flower of the Mohawks. This is bothering me because this is... There we go. Paper won't stay. Okay, today we're going to talk about the virtues. And maybe I'll get through it all. Maybe I won't. We'll see what happens. See how far I get. This paper will not stay where I want it to stay. There we go. But the virtues and how they tie into or somehow connect to um, medical ethics or bioethics. And there you see um, the virtues represented by four statues of women. You have prudence, temperance, fortitude, and justice. I hope that's right. I hope I figured out figured it out from their symbols. Ms. Oh, sorry, Ms. Pullman. But I hope I figured it out correctly from the very the, from the symbols of each woman. But then again, it, I guess it doesn't really matter. They look kind of the same. My camera here. What is a virtue? Now, this is our old definition because I talked about the virtues when I talked about various types of ethical systems, and one of those is virtue ethics. And there are bioethicists who try to apply virtues the practice of the virtues to bioethics. How that works is, is, is a matter of debate. You know, as I think I might have told you that some people criticize virtue ethics as being maybe too generalized to be applicable to specific cases, but let's see. Let's see what the virtues are and see how applicable they are. But a virtue is a firm disposition of the intellect and the will to do habitually what is good and right for the human person. Okay, so that's our old definition. You should be familiar with that. It comes from the Latin word virtus or virtutus in the, in the uh, genitive or the possessive form of the virtue. And literally, it comes from the Latin word vir, vir or weir. 
um, v can, the v the v in classical Latin is pronounced like a w, and we still have that. We have that word in English. Interestingly enough, I love language, and I find language is fascinating. But we still have that word uh, weir or veer in Latin, which means a male, um, in the word werewolf. The first part of werewolf, where is from veer, which means man, a man wolf. So we have it in English as well, even though we don't realize it. So veer means manliness. It means literally a male human being. A math, assigned male at birth, I guess is that. <laughs> Anyways, um, to put it into modern parlance. So manliness, the bodily and the bodily and mental excellences found in men, such as virtues such as strength, endurance, bravery, um, stuff like that. So there is a kind of chauvinistic, sexist um, underpinning to the word. I'm not going to deny that. Uh, and that probably comes from the fact that most philosophers in the ancient world and many cultures were male. So they saw things through the male lens, okay? But it can be, ex the, it can be extended to not just mean manliness, but it can mean anything that has worth or power and to moral perfection. It doesn't necessarily have to mean what are the excellences of the male human being. It can, the word virtue can be anything that morally perfects the human being, both male and female. But you just have to be aware of that because sometimes in the, in the philosophical literature from the ancient world, you can, you know, sometimes the question is raised, can women be virtuous? Why is that even a question? Well, because it's a question because of where the word comes from. It's virtue from veer, from male human being. So they ask that question. And of course women can be virtuous. That's, you know, I think that's not, not it should not even be a question, but it was for them based on their understanding of where the word came from. It's Mitchell. So moral excellence, and that's the way I'll be using it in the course. I'm not using it in a chauvinistic or, sec or sexist way. I'm using it in the sense of anything that is a moral excellence or a moral perfection, actions that we do to perfect the human person. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 1804, in case you're interested, and in this section it deals with the virtues, both generally and individually, and it gives quite a nice definition. Human virtues are firm attitudes, stable dispositions, habitual perfections of the intellect and will that govern our actions, govern our actions, so our moral, our moral activity, order our passions, they order our feelings, excuse me, and guide our conduct, guide generally what we do, according to reason and faith. They make possible so, it would be possible ease, self-mastery, and joy in leading a morally good life. The virtuous man is he or she who freely practices the good. So the, they're tools. The virtues are tools for leading a morally good life, for mastering myself, because I know that I, I, I know, I don't know about you, but I know for myself that I can be deviant. I can, you know, know something is good for me, but still want to do a bad thing or an evil thing, or I can choose to do something that doesn't benefit me or perfect me. And if I have the right virtues in place that I've practiced habitually, those can kind of lead my conscience to make the right decisions and lead my will to make the right decisions, hopefully easily, but I master myself and joyfully. I see the benefit, I enjoy the benefit that arises from the virtue leading me to practice good, good, uh, good deeds, a good way of life. Specifically, you could say that a virtue is an inner disposition to perform morally right actions of a certain kind. Okay, there are certain actions of a certain there are actions of a certain kind that we should be habitually motivated to perform. Or another way to describe it is a tendency to act rightly by habit in a particular manner. Okay, it gives you a tendency. 
which is kind of the same way of saying habit. So maybe I'm being redundant here. But anyways, a tendency to act rightly in a particular manner. So there are certain actions which are virtuous and certain actions which are not virtuous. They don't build up that moral virtue for us. So they don't build up what you might call it, um, that tendency within us. Through moral virtue, we can acquire a relatively stable disposition that inclines one powerfully to do the good. Okay? Just like a person has a habit of going to the gym, maybe in the uh, going to the gymnasium to work out, or you go out running or whatever. You know, at the beginning, it's usually tough. You have to build the habit because you don't have the habit. But once you build the habit, it's like, oh, you know, you know, Mr. Thatch is always in the gym, you know. <laughs> That's where you always see him, you know. He's there lifting weights or jogging on the machine or doing uh, doing push-ups, whatever. And I'll move on from you, Mr. Thatch, is my, my example. Um, but nevertheless, it becomes a habit. And athletes know this as well because practice is habit. That's if you don't have the habit then you don't become a, as superior a player as you might want to be. You have to constantly practice. Now, does it get boring? Is, does it get repetitive? Yes, that's what habit is. It's repetitive. But eventually, it becomes easier. And there might I'm not saying there aren't rough patches where it's just like, oh, I just don't want to go. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. But that's where you have to kind of reinvigorate the habit within you. Okay, but once it becomes what it st might start out slow, but once it becomes a habit, it becomes a stable. It becomes a a power within you to do what you want to do. It becomes stable within you, a stable disposition. Moral virtue isn't just action. It's not just action. It is action. It is doing things, but it's more conformity to truly human living. The virtues should conform us to what true it truly means to be a human person. And moral virtue perfects the will, my, my ability to choose, and those faculties or those powers that are subject to my will. Okay, it can make my will, a perfection is to make my will stronger. So when those rough patches do come and I don't want to do something, I force myself to do it. Like last night, I didn't want to go to my exercise class. It's late in the evening. It's at the local library, and the lady is a killer. <laughs> she, she's a beast. You know, she's like, you know, she has this like doing this stuff. It's like, you know, extend, bend, jump in place, extend. Bend. I'm like, what are you doing to me, lady? You know, you're killing me. You know, look at me. Yeah, and, it, and there's no breaks for either. There are hardly any breaks to kind of catch your breath. I mean, I give myself breaks because I have to. But man, this lady is one fit woman. Um, but I'm dying. But my because I'm making habitual by going, and I have a reason to go. Part of you know I give my the carrot on a stick is like I paid for it, so I'm, I don't want to waste my money. But you know the virtue of going perfects my will and the power. It makes my will stronger to go. So even though I might be like ah, I don't want to get into the car, it's cold out. You know, don't want to get into the car and drive there. No, I'm I'm going to go. My will takes over. It's the perfection of my freedom, my freedom to choose. Traditionally, um, virtue is defined as a habitus or a habit, a habit in Latin. That's all, all it means. It's a Latin word for, ma um, for, for habit. And it means in a positive meaning. It, by habitus or habit, it's not something like OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder. It's not something that's done over and over again mindlessly by rote. That's not what virtue is about. Because remember, it's both the intellect and the will acting together. Rather, it's the constant choice to do good which can change my behavior. Okay? Think of someone like, think of a habit. When you think of habitus, think of, say, think of someone who, say, is a recovering drug or alcohol addict. They have to make a constant, that person has to make a constant choice every day, sometimes every hour, sometimes every minute, to avoid alcohol, to avoid drugs. It's, it's not, sometimes it's not a day-to-day -day thing, it's a minute-to-minute -minute thing. But they make a constant choice to do the good, with the, do that which perfects them, which is to avoid drug and alcohol, because they know that drugs and alcohol don't perfect them, don't benefit them. And it can change their behavior to where they don't want it anymore. 
Not that it's not there, not that the desire is not there because it is an addiction and it's a disease, but you know, uh, a lot of it is also choice. You get into the hobby to us of taking the drugs and the alcohol and you feel that you need those things. Same thing with people, I mentioned OCD before, part of obsessive compulsive disorder is you, know, you start, it, you, know, you, you, get, you habituate the mind and, and the body to doing things um, and you can't stop. Or it's very difficult to stop. Turn, you can't turn off that switch. The same thing, same thing with an addict. But you can forge character by, by practicing the opposite habit of not taking drugs and alcohol. The, the virtue, that virtue can forge your character and make it easier to practice the good. I get that. Well, not there yet. What does this have to do with bioethics? Virtue is, and I'm quoting here, who am I quoting from? Let me look at my notes. Ah, this is from David, a uh, uh, brief chapter by David Beauregard in a book called Catholic Healthcare Ethics, a Manual for Practitioners, which is third edition, which is put out by the Na National Catholic Bioethics Center. So if you have interest, if you have questions about Catholic bioethics, there is a National Catholic Bioethics Center. I think it's in Washington, D.C., located there. And uh, they have a website, and they've got all sorts of resources that you can, you can uh, look at those. And I got this big honking book that they put out, just all these articles on just about everything having to do with bioethics. Um, not going to read the whole thing. <laughs> You know, but I take from it what I need, you know, because just I just don't have the time to read this like 800 page book. Um, not for this class, at least, um, maybe in, in the in the fullness of time. But I certainly am going to take things from it. You know, so, oh, there's an article here on this. So I can use that. There's an article here on that. I can use that. Anyways, so I, I looked at their article that they had on virtues. Hello, sir. On virtues. Okay. And he described virtue is the perfection of the acting agent. And as that's the quote, the, the per, virtue is the perfection of the acting agent, according to David Beauregard. And as such, virtue is necessary in bioethics as a subjective complement to objective rules, principles, laws, etc. Why? Because objective rules, principles, laws, etc. simply define abstractly what should be done. And I might have given you a definition of abstraction or abstract before, but I'll give it again, hopefully. Um, whereas with abstraction, you, you take something, um, gen you generalize from a, some, a specific experience. So... You have a poem, which is a very specific, concrete thing. Someone writes a poem, but poetry is an abstraction because you've taken from the specific and you've generalized it. You're not talking about the poem in particular. You're talking about poetry, which is a general idea. So, you know, laws define in general, generalize what should be done, but... Um, they, they give a general rule, but it's apart from concrete historical situations which the acting agent might face. Okay, you might have the general rule from the natural moral law of doing good and avoiding evil, but it doesn't tell you whether performing surgery, cutting some bo one's body open with a scalpel, is doing good to them or doing evil to them. You know, because... On the one hand, you could be a well-meaning, well-intending surgeon who's doing her job by trying to remove a pathology by surgery. On the other hand, you could be Dr. Giggles, <laughs> you know, who just wants to cut people open to kill them <laughs> and cause them pain, you know, from the movie Dr. Giggles in the 90s. Um, it depends. If we need laws, rules, and procedures to guide us, to both the common and individual good, that we need virtuous agents, virtuous agents, virtuous actors, who will make judgments in applying those laws and will employ the skills in using medical procedures in the healing process. So what does that mean? It's just a fancy way of saying that, thus, even though we need something to tell us what to do, 
We need people who have a right mind and a, a right mind to figure out what to do in certain circumstances and also the right will to have the strength and the courage and the fortitude to do those things in those circumstances um, for the benefit of, of this case of the heal of the patient, which is healing. So action requires both exterior laws, law, you know, general principles are important. I hope I've made that clear um, for giving guidance, but also you need the interior disposition, the, the will to follow them, to will to listen to those principles and to put them into action, which is not always easy, as I think, you know, some of you may have realized with, you know, paper number two, where I asked you to apply ethical principalism to a specific case. Not that I think ethical principalism is the way to go, because um, we've talked about other things that are not embodied in, in ethical principalism, like the natural law, God's revelation and scripture and, and tradition and the magisterium. Um, but it's a way, it is a, it's, it's a, it's a solution. It's a, it's a way to help people think through ethically what they should do in, in a, a situation, specifically a medical situation. Um, but it's, you know, you need the interior disposition. It's not, you, you might have the principle and know what each one is, you know, okay, I know autonomy, I know it's that, and I know non-maleficence and beneficence and justice, I know what those are. But then you're confronted with an actual concrete situation. It's like, oh, wow, how does justice actually apply here? The principle of justice. Um, I think some people stumbled on that, and it's it's a hard one. I, I think that was the hardest of the four principles to apply. How did you? How would you apply justice to the woman who didn't want treatment? So we need the interior disposition as well. Simply following the rules and laws, and let me say that let say this again. Simply following the rules and laws does not mean one is a moral person. It means you might mean you act morally and ethically, but it does not make you necessarily a moral person. What it makes you is a legalist. A legalist. You simply follow the rule because you're told to. And that's not always a bad thing, you know, for a person who's a person who's thinking of committing suicide who thinks, well, you know, God says thou shalt not kill, so I shouldn't kill myself, so I won't do it. You know, they're not going through a great ethical deliberation over the issue. They're just like, you know, I don't, I don't want to kill myself because God says thou shalt not kill. He's, in a way, the person's being a legalist. So, but if it keeps them from not killing themselves, then okay, I'm all for that. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to criticize that kind of thinking. But true, a superior, optimal form of thinking is beyond legalism, that you not only can follow a rule or a principle, but understand why you're doing it and want to do it. So simply following the general rules and principles is, is, is not necessarily make someone moral, it just makes them a legalist. A nurse, for example, can follow the standards of clinical nursing practice, which is put out by the American Nurses Association, and that would make a, nur a nurse an adequate nurse. You'd be adequate, but not necessarily truly good, a truly good or excellent nurse. Something more comes, needs to come in here. Okay, if you're just following the directives of of the uh, that are the ethical directives that are put out by your organization, yeah, you're an adequate doctor, you're an adequate nurse, an adequate radiologist, an adequate social worker, an adequate businessman, but you're not necessarily truly good or excellent at it, unless you go more. Why? Because you're merely carrying out the exterior actions passively. There's no interior disposition towards perfecting, in this case, the example of a nurse, the nursing vocation, the, which mean, means the development of your knowledge, the development of your talent, of your sensitivity, of your patience, of your skill as a nurse. So the perfection of the acting agent who must carry out rules laws and procedures of good medicine is essential to the good of the patient okay that is, the rules are there for a purpose some sometimes it is it is good not it's not the ultimate good but sometimes it is good to just follow the rule just do what you're told and and you don't have the time to ask why because maybe you're in an emergency situation you know if you're um 
you know, a, a training nurse or you're a resident and you're just, or, you know, you're on your clerkship from medical school and you're just there learning and the nurse or the doctor tells you, okay, just do this. Okay. You don't have, maybe you don't have time to then, okay, but why are we doing this? What's the purpose of this doctor? You know, what, is, what good is this to the patient? No, just shove it into the guy's chest. <laughs> you know, we, we got to evacuate the fluid or he's going to die. You know, we have to regulate the heart rate, you know? Um, so, you know, it's a sense that, so having rules and procedures is good to the patient, but virtue goes beyond the minimum that the law requires or merely technical aspects of treatment to embrace the dimension of quality of care for the patient. So when you're talking about the quality of care in the medical scenario, this is where virtue comes in. You're caring more than just, um, okay, the patient is the patient in the bed, is the patient comfortable? You know, they got the IV in, you've done all the things you're supposed to do, patient is covered with a blanket, whatever. Um, no, there's more to the quality of care than just the patient has a bed, has the IV, has the proper medical um, care that the person is getting. There's more than that that needs to be done. But just for example, you need to feed the patient. You know, you need to check in on the patient, talk to the patient. Knowledge of human virtues is acquired in several ways. And now we're on the PowerPoint. Finally, um, a natural capacity. The, we have a, a capacity, a power, an ability according to our human nature to acquire virtues. They're there. We have this capacity. Doesn't mean we necessarily have them. We have to acquire them. But the, we have this ability. We know about them through education and learning. We can know about the virtues, which are the most important virtues, what are virtues to begin with, and which are the most important virtues. We acquire them through deliberate acts. They require practice, which like exercise. And we need to persevere in them. We need to continue in them, not just practice them. I mean, part of practice is perseverance. You have to continue in the practice. There are two types of human virtue. Types that we could say that there is the type that is simply from our human nature that we possess as created human beings, but there is another kind, Ms. Reeser, that comes from God, <laughs> the Lord. <laughs> and the one that comes from human nature is called acquired. And the one Ms. Teas Ojeda that comes from the Lord, not Dr. Dunn, the Lord Lord, Ms. Teas Ojeda, um, is called infused, infused. Why are they called acquired? Because these virtues can be gotten through human effort. And for a Christian, a Christian would add, and with God's grace, because, you know, God, God's grace is just a theological word for God's help. So a fancy religious word for the help that God gives um, us to achieve anything, spiritually, physically, okay? Um, so it's not all by human effort. There, you know, we certainly need God help. Just the very fact that we exist is due to God's gracious providence, that he keeps things in existence. Um, they are acquired, natural, uh, natural virtues, I should say natural virtues. Acquired virtues are called acquired because they can be gotten. The, the ability is there, it's latent, and it can be gotten, it can be possessed. You can acquire a virtue. You can also lose virtues as well if you don't practice them. And acquired virtues are developed by repeated acts, Ms. McLeod. Repeated acts over and over and over again. And what they do, acquired virtues, is modify, and I guess also the, the infused virtues, you can say this as well. They modify the innate resources of a person's faculties or powers. So they're mo they modify our human nature. They change us. They make us hopefully better, better persons. In the same sense, to use continue to use this analogy as physical exercise. 
people value physical exercise, but you know, also mental. The virtues are kind of a mental exercise. Well, they're also practiced as well. You do them physically, um, but you know, we see the value of physical exercise. And when you start physical exercise again, and before it becomes a habit, it's tough. You know, you're sore. Your your body, you're slow. Um, you're not as agile, maybe. But the more you practice, and again, this goes with athletes and our basketball team or soccer or um, volleyball team, you start to, you know, maybe in the beginning, you're not so good. You're not so good at it. But as you practice, you develop the habit. You develop the habit. It modifies you. Your body starts developing muscle memory in your mind. You start seeing things like like a baseball player, you know, start seeing the pitches. The pitches look really fast in the beginning, but as you get used to it, it's, you know, you can start seeing the pitches, okay? Um, if you're on the soccer field and you see someone pass the ball to you, maybe in the beginning, you know, you're, well, first of all, you're running slowly and you're not as agile and you're not as adept, but as you start getting the virtue of an athlete and the virtue of your, your craft, I guess you could say, as an athlete, particularly, say, in this case, a soccer player, you can start getting vision and see things on the field and say, okay, I know where he's going to pass the ball to me down there. Whereas before, you might have missed it. It modifies you. It modifies the way you look at the world. It modifies your body. Your skill levels are modified. Okay, the same thing goes on with virtues. The more you practice prudence or justice or fortitude or temperance, it modifies modifies your will and you don't want certain things as much or maybe not maybe not as uh well you don't want certain things as much or it's easier for to for you to put things aside that maybe before you would have instead felt that you needed for yourself for your for your betterment the infused virtues come from god and uh i'm gonna see if i actually do that. Uh, I don't think I do. No. Anyways, um, from then, you know, acquire, we can understand what the word acquire means. It means to get infused comes simply from the Latin word um, infus, infusus, which means poured into. Poured into. So these virtues are kind of poured into our soul. Whoops. So like you pour water into a glass, consider to think of your soul as the glass and the infused virtues as those virtues which are poured into it by God. The infused virtues are added onto the natural virtues which a man or woman can have. So they're, you call it, say they're super added in a way. They're super added to the natural virtues which you can have. And um, so you have the, the ability for the infused virtues, but they really need to be actuated by God. Through the efforts of Greek philosophers, mainly Greek philosophers, ancient Greek philosophers, in their discussions of virtue, um, they have sometimes summarized four virtues as essential. These are not the only things that can be identified as virtues. There are other things that perfect us, like friendship. Friendship is a virtue. Um, I've mentioned athletics. Okay, there are physical activities that are virtues and have their own virtues. Um, like, you know, with athletics, it would be agility, um, vision. You feel you're able to see see things and to un, you know see the plane the, the playing field and stuff. But so there are certain things, and you know, like if you're a surgeon, the skill in using a scalpel and being able to cut things, you know, without you know you don't cut the wrong thing. So there are certain a person who's a musician who's able to play well. There are certain things that have their own particular skills to the particular activity. So virtue can be applied to a general sense of things and a whole bunch of things. But there are four cardinal ones. The word cardinal in Latin comes from hinge. So there are four hinge virtues that the Greek philosophers saw as essential to the virtuous life. They're the virtues from which other virtues come. I've mentioned to you before the virtue of ver religion. The practice of religion is considered a virtue, and it comes under the virtue of justice, for example. 
But we'll start with number one, which is prudence. Well, I should tell you what they are. Prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance are the four cardinal virtues. Excuse me. And we'll start with prudence, obviously. Number one. And here you see in this in the picture kind of the the sexism of the term. This is a picture that a uh, painting by Paolo Veronese. It's even called Prudence and Manly Virtue. It's kind of a re again a redundancy because virtue already means manly. But anyways, and here you have the virtue, which is per which is perceived or pictured as a woman, and then you have a man lying. I don't know what the man's all up to, but anyways, um, nevertheless. What is prudence? It's the disposition of the practical reason to seek out the good in every circumstance and choose the right way to get it. So it's a similar definition to conscience in a way, which is the disposition of the practical reason to um, figure out what is the good thing to do and what is not the good thing to do, what is the morally good thing to do. Um, so there, I guess there's kind of a coalescence or coming together here of prudence and conscience, although they're not exactly the same thing. Okay, um, because there are things that, out of prudence, I might recognize as a good to be done, which is which is not necessarily a good thing to do, <laughs> at least anymore. And uh, for example, um, hitting your child or hitting a child in prudence, you might think you might think that it's a prudent thing to do because you're disciplining, you're teaching your child the right way to do things. So you give you know, child a slap or something like that, or hit the child. Um, but that might not be a morally good thing, or we might not recognize it today as a morally good thing to do in conscience to do it. So in conscience, you shouldn't do it. Whereas, you know, for example, in the ancient world, harshness, believe it or not, harshness was a virtue. To be harsh on children, slaves, other people, even yourself, was considered a virtue. It was a survival tactic because the world was harsh. So this idea of, just to kind of segue into like Christianity or even Judaism, this ideal, ideal of a God or a savior like Jesus, who is you know, gentle and humble of heart, that was, not, that was not a virtue in the ancient Greek and Roman world. That was not something you aspired to. You know, the, God, the, the gods that the Greeks and Romans worshipped were generally, typically not gentle, meek, humble creatures. They were boastful. They were proud. They were out there, you know, they, they, and they were harsh. If you crossed them, they would hit you with some punishment that was truly, truly awful to teach you a lesson. Um, so, the, you know, the idea of the Jewish God who is loving and merciful, forgiving of sins and faults, and Jesus who's humble and a meek, a good shepherd who seeks out the lost sheep, you know, this message of Christianity was seen as something that was weak. Anyways, so prudence, yes, the practical reason to seek out what is the good, the benefit, and the circumstance, and the right way to get it. Although, remember, that might not always be what is a good thing to do, for, at least from a Christian perspective. Okay, so from, again, in certain cultures, in prudence, it may be a benefit to, to in prudence, to kill an enemy before that enemy kills you, to do a little preemptive striking. From a Christian perspective, that is not not proper and not moral because you're killing someone who has not done anything to you, even though you think they're going to do something to you. And so there is a question of the moral the morality of that action, even though it might be a prudent action. Prudence comes from the Latin prudentia, which means foresight to see beforehand, kind of be able to see and uh, you know see what's going to happen beforehand and, and act accordingly. Prudentia, foresight. Prudence is also called wisdom sometimes, and prudence is the virtue of the intellect, which allows me to make the best practical judgment as the best possible course of action under certain circumstances. That's why it's practical. Wisdom, okay, practical because I'm doing something. It's wisdom because it's part of the intellect. It's the ability to adapt appropriate means wisely to reach the good or reach a good or beneficial goal. 
It's my capacity to judge correctly in the moral realm what I should do. And it should be combined with conscience so that I'm not only seeking out the good, but that the moral action that I'm doing is truly good. And prudence, prudence helps me apply general principles to particular circumstances. So going back to what I was saying before about bioethics, um, you have general rules and principles, you have ethical directives, you have codes of ethics, but prudence is the virtue you need to put those into practice in your actual work as a nurse, as a physician, as a social worker. You need the virtue of prudence. You need to be able to um, apply those general principles to particular circumstances. Prudence is a perfection of reason. It's a perfect, since it's a, the intellect is a perfection of reason about particular judgments in order to judge correctly, to see what is the right thing to do. St. Thomas Aquinas, whom I've mentioned before, this medieval saint and, and thinker, called prudence right reason in action. It's right reason in action. And in that, he's just following the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle, who I've mentioned before when we talked about virtue. Prudence is so important that it is called the charioteer of the virtues. Okay, the charioteer of the virtues. A charioteer is someone who's in a chariot with horses and pulling the horses are pulling him along. Okay, so you know, prudence is that thing that kind of gives guidance even to the other virtues. It allow you know, make sure that the even with the virtues, because you want to have a via media, you want to have a balance in the virtues. You can be too virtuous, just as you can be too little virtuous. Okay, um, a person can ha can be uh, too courageous, which is a virtue. They can, which makes them foolhardy. They they rush into places where they shouldn't go, and they can make a situation worse. On, on the other hand, they can have too little of the virtue of co courage and be cowardly. You want that just the right balance of courage, and prudence helps you determine that. That's why they call it the charioteer of the virtues. The next virtue is justice. And I think I mentioned this before. We've had, I think we've had this word before. The act of giving to someone whatever he or she deserves. What, to give what is his or her, her due. What is merited by a person. What a person merits. Another way of describing it is justice. In other words, is uh, fairness. To be fair or to be impartial, impartial, that you give the same part to each person, okay, impartial, partial from the word part. Now for someone like Plato, the philosopher Plato, and I forget his date, but I believe it was in the 400 BC, it is justice that is the integrative, integrative virtue, not prudence. Plato considers the just. Plato considers justice the um, highest of the cardinal virtues. Why? Because it involves the harmonious functioning. With justice, I know how each of the other virtues is supposed to function: prudence, fortitude, and temp temperance, as an ordered, ordered whole and ruled by reason. So he considers justice the the chief of the cardinal virtues. But most philosophers would not agree with him. As I said, they would call prudence the chief integrative virtue. Justice helps one make the best. In the case of, say, bioethics, justice is a principle that we've encountered because it helps us make the best, most equitable use of medical goods possible. So you see justice ethically being practiced in, in, the pra in the practice of triage. That would be an example of the virtue of justice. Okay? Because each person is due... Justice is not about equality. It's about fairness. It's about, one can say, equity, but not equality. Okay, everyone should be treated equitably, each per sick person who's coming into your office or into your hospital, but you don't treat them equally. 
Okay, a person who comes in with a gunshot to the chest, injustice deserves more care, more treatment, faster treatment than someone who comes in who has maybe, you know, cut his hand or something. Or, you know, just has a, a minor, you know, is just feeling sick that day, has some minor, you know, feels, has a fever and doesn't feel very well, Might, maybe has the flu or something. Okay, it's, that's not as serious. It could be as serious, but it could become serious, um, but it's not as serious as someone who's been shot in the chest and there could be damage to the heart or to the, one of the arteries or veins around the heart and might need immediate surgery. So if your justice helps you make the most best equitable use of your medical goods. You, you have to know who to treat and when to treat that person. Justice can be an ethical issue for um, general, pra general practitioners because you might be seeing so many patients that you don't get to see them all, all the time or you don't get to see them within a good time frame because if, especially if you're in a consortium or a group of a doctor's group or something, they sometimes have standards of how many patients you need to need to see in order to make it, you know, financially profitable, economically profitable. Um, there's profit involved and that can, that can skew the ethics because, you know, you're seeing somebody for maybe a few minutes or several minutes and that might not be enough. That really might not be enough to, to delve into the case. I know my, for my example, my psychiatrist complained to me one time about all, if he did, had to do all the paperwork that he was required to do, he'd only be, have been able to see me about a minute and a half or any of his patients, like a minute and a half, because there's just Medicaid and Medicare and all the insurance companies want so much information, so much paperwork filled out that it's not physically possible for him to do that or uh, temporarily, chronologically possible. So of course, a lot of the time you see these doctors, you know, filling out paperwork after their shift, spending maybe hours extra filling out forms. What's the ethics of that? I mean, there's a purpose to it and there might be a good purpose, but is it, you know, what's injustice? What is that? Is that denying justice to the patients who are more important than filling out the papers, just filling out information? So justice involves right ordering, the establishment of a kind of harmony in human relationships which promotes equity, which promotes fairness and equal standing. Equal as far as you can, well, I shouldn't say equal, so equitable standing. I don't want to confuse you with any. Um, equitable standing. People are treated by what they deserve, what is due them. A person who is, has a more serious illness, has, injustice has more due to that person than someone who does not have a serious illness. And that should be my ethical decision, or at least affect my ethical decision. This is just a quotation from one of the Psalms, Psalm 146. Um, Blessed is the one whose help is the God of Jacob. Jacob is one of the ancient Jewish ancestors. Um, the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the seas and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, secures justice for the oppressed, who gives bread to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord raises up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects the resident alien. He comes to the aid of the orphan, child who has no parents, or the widow, a woman who has no husband and thwarts the way of the wicked. I thought that was appropriate because I mentioned some of the virtues, it mentions justice, it mentions faith, which is one of the infused virtues, <clears throat> righteousness, which could be a form, <clears throat> could be described as prudence. But you know, God is always different. God, God rolls his own, you know what I'm saying? You know, God goes his own way. And you know, the virtue, God is virtuous as well. He's the source of the virtues, but notice that he does have a point of view about how the virtues are to be practiced. Practiced, And in the, in the mind of God, at least from Revelation, his revelation in this psalm, which is just a song, that's what all psalms are, they're songs that were sung probably in the temple by the Jews. Um, but look at who God is on the side of, the oppressed, those who are hungering, those who are physically hungry, prisoners, people who are imprisoned doesn't make a distinction of whether they did, did it or not, just that people who are in prison, people who are blind, people who have physical ailments, 
people who are refugees or resident aliens or illegal aliens is another way of saying it, migrants. Okay, people who have no one to help them. That's where the Lord's justice is. That's how God views justice. Um, those who need more help than other people, the oppressed, the outcast. And that's a lot of what you're going to be dealing with when you're, when you're dealing in your medical, medical work or your social work. You're going to be dealing with people who are oppressed, outcast, and marginalized. You know, yes, you're going to get people, middle class people, to come through your emergency room. But you're also going to get a lot of homeless people, drug addicts, prostitutes, you know, people who, you know, people who are mentally ill, a lot of them, elderly people, okay, who, who need help. And those, they're the ones, not that God doesn't love the middle class person who comes in who is, is generally fine in his or her life, um, is financially secure maybe, and is a sound mind and more or less body, although they might, if they're not if they're sick, if they're in the hospital. But the Lord looks out for those who are, it's a special care and concern for those who are oppressed and marginalized and outcast. That's his justice. His view of justice, I should say. Number three, fortitude, fortitude, strength, fortis, fuerte, yes, in the Spanish and Latin-based language. Strength, the firmness of purpose, it's the disposition which gives us a firmness of purpose to pursue the good in the face of difficulties. Another word for this is courage. Prudence, another word for prudence is wisdom, another pr word for justice is fairness. Another word for fortitude, fortitude is courage, and is the will to overcome obstacles and temptations in the moral life. And there will be temptations. <laughs> Many temptations. And temptation doesn't necessarily mean, it's not necessarily meant in a religious sense. Although that's the way a lot of people might take it. You know, I was tempted the other day to put sugar in my coffee. Because I like sugary coffee. I like sweet coffee. But I know that sugar is generally bad for me because it'll make me fat. So I save it for the weekends. I, you know, I put, you know, sugar or honey in my tea on the weekends and stuff like that, or sugar in my coffee. I save that for the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. That's when I splurge. But during the week, I don't. And yeah, it's a temptation to to not do it. To, you know, I really want something sweet, you know, in my coffee. But but fortitude. Okay, so fortitude does not necessarily mean in a Temptation, I do not necessarily mean temptation in a spiritual or religious sense. There are all sorts of temptations. Temptations to not go to the gym, to not eat right, to not take care of yourself. Fortitude gives me the capability, the power, the ability to endure, resist, and alter adversity as it comes to me. Fortitude. It helps control my feelings, my passions, making them habitually Obedient, fortitude. Okay, this is something that's really necessary if you are facing addiction. Okay, addicts know this. They know fortitude. They know they have to be can develop this re this repetition of saying no to the things that causes their addiction. You're controlling the feelings, the passions that drive you to that. Fortitude. Fortitude is the ability to act according to reason in the face of fear. It doesn't mean you're not afraid or it's not painful to not do something or to choose not to do something that's not a perfection of you, but you do it. The Christian would add or Christianity would add this ability to act comes with confidence in God, that God has your back and God will help you get through it. And you see there, the Latin word forti simply means strong or strength. So it's strength. Fourth cardinal virtue is temperance. Temperance, which comes from the Latin word tempero, which means to divide or portion out. Which I don't know what to do with that one. <laughs> but it also means to moderate. So moderation might be another word for temperance. Temperance means moderation, self-control, especially in regard to your desires and appetites. And this is, this is hard. Temperance is a hard one, okay? Again, as someone who's an addict understands temperance, although 
they understand that that control self control has to be absolute because i can't an alcoholic can't have just one drink or a drug addict can't just take one hit of cocaine or something okay so there's some things where temperance means nothing no go don't but there are other things that are goods these are good things good desires and appetites but they need to be moderated sex you need to be there needs to be self control in regards to sex it's a good desire it's a good appetite a good wish of the human person remember it's one of it's the second inclination of the natural law according to thomas aquinas the our desire for sex and for procreation um but you know eating is something that needs to be moderated in self control we certainly need to eat that's not a question it's a good, does it benefit us and make it make us better yeah of course it does we see that you know we need the energy for ourselves but it needs to be moderated otherwise you end up on you know that show my 600 pound life <laughs> you know so, which you know she's a beautiful person but you know you're dealing with morbid obesity and i i know that because i have family members who have morbid obesity and you can't move it's you know, it's difficult to move around and you know it's like if if the person ever fell on the floor i'm not strong enough to pick pick her or him up because they're too heavy for me so you know it, it affects a lot of simple things it's just like walking you know trying to walk walk around a little bit you know you, your your knees and hips can't handle it when you're morbidly obese because moderation and control even in eating which is a good for us our old friend saint thomas aquinas defines or divides temperance into two kinds I have some time, I guess I'll give it to you. Um, divides it into two kinds, general temperance and specific temperance. Why not? There's general temperance and there's specific temperance. General temperance moderates the other moral virtues. Okay, you want to be temperate, you want to be prudent in the practice of the other moral virtues to know what to do them, uh, what, uh, what to do, but also know how to do. And I think, uh, I hope it didn't, well, I don't want to confuse the issue, but I think temperance is where, this is where the balance comes in with temperance, knowing whether to, how courageous I need to be in a certain situation um if i'm practicing fortitude um you can be too prudent even you can be so prudent that you never come to a decision because you're not uh, you're not sure where you might be you, you deliberate endlessly about what to do where you're too prudent and you can have a lack of prudence where you don't think about you're thoughtless and you just do things without really thinking them through and they they blow up in your face or they hurt somebody so temperance helps us to balance that general temperance it can moderate the other moral virtue specific temperance controls the bodily pleasures so specific temperance is you know alcohol sex food the things that drive us okay these bodily pleasures that's where that's where temperance becomes specific temperance is associated with a sense of proportion and moral discernment okay it gives us a sense of proportion you know the people a person who's intemperate sometimes you'll hear a person say my eyes or my stomach is bigger or my, my eyes are bigger than my stomach when it comes to food okay what we see um you know we see all the food that we can at a banquet or something we're thinking about thinking about thanksgiving coming up next week and you might go out somewhere and they have a whole banquet and have all this stuff set out all this food and people go around at the buffet and they take food yeah your eyes can be bigger than your stomach you can overeat you can your stomach can't fit in all the things you want to eat so you need a sense temperance can give you a sense of proportion of how much you can eat enjoyably temperance moderates the attraction of pleasures and balances the use of created goods by practicing the virtue of temperance you know you some some of the some of the pleasures that you want might not seem as pleasurable anymore in little bits yes but not as much okay um and sometimes you get this when you know you hear older people might talk about oh, it's the simple things in life that matter anymore when you're young you know you want to go out 
and you want everything to be a party, everything to be like at a, a Taylor Swift concert, everything to be like at the club, you know, everything's great, the music is loud, the uh, the drinks are flowing, unless you're 21, not 21, then, you know, just have some juice or something. <laughs> you, know, so, you know what I'm saying? But anyways, you know, the, the, your friends are all there. So, and that's, you know, but once you get on in life and, la and later on in life, you know, those things don't, they're great, they were enjoyable, but they don't necessarily matter as much anymore. The simple things matter. The attraction of the pleasure, you start maybe practicing temperance more, you don't need to go out clubbing, you don't need to, oh, you know, go out and everything has to have, you know, you're doing shots, or you're doing drinks, or you have food, and also, you don't need all of that, but, you know, maybe just the simple pleasure of being with people, you're, you're, Prudent, a temperance can change your perspective. It can moderate the attraction of the pleasure. Not that the pleasure wasn't good to begin with, but it moderates it. Temperance subjects the emotions to an upright will and choosing what's morally good rather than what's simply good. Food is a good, but overeating, gluttony, is a sin. It's an evil. It's, it's, it, it harms us to, to overeat. Um... There are created goods, food, drink, sex, relaxation, okay? Um, but taken to excess or even not excess, because I think of, say, someone who starves himself or herself, like someone who's bulimic or has anorexia, um, that's the opposite of overeating. Um, it's not a benefit to us. So temperance places a limit on our desires. Not that our desires are bad. It's like it's not like oh, this is killjoy time. You know, this is oh, you're going to be the party pooper. No, it's, they're good. Life, living life is great. All right, but there are standards that are part of our human nature, and we see this, and they're natural standards by which we should live, called the virtues, which help us make the goods that we want to enjoy more enjoyable. At least they should. Now, I can move on to the, oh, can I talk about that? I guess I'm not going to talk about that. Or maybe I'll talk about that on Thursday. Okay, so it's it's already 1040, so usually around this time my alarm should be going off, but it's not. Hmm. Ah, now I speak of the devil. <laughs> you little devil. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll end here and I'll, I'll finish off with virtue and uh, God willing start principle of double effect on Thursday. God bless you all. Have a good day. Remember, the quiz is out there, so please have it done by Friday. Quiz number four. Excuse me, Mr. Dietz. Have you seen Max? Wait, wait. Oh, you texted me this morning. He said he was sending you an email. Okay, good. While he was there. But okay. So, yeah, he said he followed us there. All right, fine. So, he's going to send me Since you're my only conduit to him, because I sent him an email, but I didn't, I didn't look to see if he sent him back. But if, if you see him, just let him know that I was asking about it. Okay. Go. Thank you. Go. Sounds good. Yeah. Have a good one. You too, sir. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Good day, Ms. Mitchell. See you Thursday. See you, Ms. Mitchell. Okay, who do we got? <laughs> Keys in. Okay. Anybody else? No. Okay. No, I think I will cut it out. I will cut it out so I can get get down to double effect. Oops. Sorry, I forgot to turn it off. <laughs> Have a good day, everybody. God bless.